Now, this is the part I wanted to get to. This is awesome, you guys. And I don't know how this escaped me, but God has just been instructing us, Mark, hasn't he? He's like bringing mm -hmm. us along as you, you and I have these conversations during the week. And we're just like little kids on Christmas. And God's like pulling back the veil, isn't he? Like a little bit at a time. Talk Amazing. about that for a second. Yeah, I don't even know how many times, you know, John will, will call me or he'll text me. I just got this revelation or I'll call him and I'll, and, and I'll text him and. We have these four hour conversations. <laughs> I wish we recorded every single one of them because we could, I mean, we could, we could do a million live streams yeah. and, and talk all day. And it's just, it's just, an ama it's the most probably amazing thing I've ever been a part of in my life. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. It's uh it's important because the testimonies that we're getting, like the one I shared are, are, are there for us. You know, like I, I never, I've never seen a ministry that had as much potential to do bring as much change, and not because of me or Mark or anything. It's just the the topic that we've been drawn into is so uh, disruptive. So this is one of the uh, second chapter of the book is the seven different types of proof, and one of them is statistic pro statistical probabilities. And we've known and talked about the fact that it's very unlikely that people could misremember the same way. But we never, I never really, it never really dawned on me to really try to do the math on that. Okay, so I took this question here and I presented it to chat and I'm going to show you what chat did for us on the math and then I'm going to show you the first of 10 interviews that I'm going to get. And then we will have what I believe is unequivocal evidence. It's irrefutable. Okay, so here's the question. If I give 10 people a fill in the blank Bible memory quiz, and I give them each 10 questions, they have to draw the answer from their own memory. It is not multiple choice. Calculate the probability that every person would get all 10 questions wrong and they would all misremember them the exact same way. Okay, so this is the first part of the response. To calculate the probability that 10 people will get all 10 questions wrong and misremember them in exactly the same way, we need to make a few assumptions. Let me check my, uh, my poll. Okay, so I took a poll We have uh, 46 respondents. 96% said no, they don't remember Noe. Hmm. Now, there you go, guys. That is incredibly compelling evidence using relying on consensus because you can't make that up. That's, um, that's a dynamic response. There's no control grid to control everybody's response. So everybody's spontaneously saying, I don't remember. So you have almost 100% response where nobody. So what does that mean to the person that's coming at you with a lot of gravitas, right? And they're trying to overpower you with their certainty argument. Well, I do. I remember Noah. Okay, well, <laughs> I got all these people over here that go in the other way. So what you got to like, you follow me? Consensus <laughs> is powerful. All right. So the first Assumption. I wanted to throw this out here because I want I want this to be vetted by everybody. I want anybody that's math man on here to uh, chime in and look at these assumptions. So let's assume that the probability of getting a question wrong from memory is some value. We'll call it P. For simplicity, let's assume P equals one, meaning each person is guaranteed to misremember every answer. Okay, now I actually asked chat to clarify that. And what it was saying is, look, you're saying you want you want the hypothetical scenario to be everybody gets it wrong. So that's what that's telling me. Okay, we're, we're converting that to math. So P equals one means everybody gets it wrong. Okay, now you have to go to how are you calculating the probability that not only everybody gets it wrong, but they get it wrong the same way. Okay, so let's call the probability that a person misremembers a question 
in the exact same wrong way as everyone else will call that Q. I'm sorry it's Q, but <laughs> that's not my choice. This is difficult to quantify since it depends on how many possible wrong answers there are. But for the sake of this example, we'll treat, treat it as a probability Q. Now, it turns out that if, if, you, if you think about it, if I say who laid down with the lamb, you could have an infinite number of responses. Mm. If you if you have the variable that it's infinite, then the math says it's impossible. There is no possible way it could happen, which is essentially what it is. But what what the chat did was they used 100 possible answers as their assumption. And based on that, it's basically still impossible. <laughs> Watch this. If we assume that the number of possible wrong answers is infinite, the probability that a person misremembers a question in the exact same way becomes extremely small. Why an infinite number of possible answers? All right, I'm going to go on past this one to the other answer, which is this one here. I said, I need you to try to qualify your answer more specifically. Can you represent that in a probability like one in a trillion? So it's easy for me to understand. Okay, so this is what it came back with. To represent the probability more clearly as one in X form, we need to make some educated assumptions about the likelihood of misremembering each question in a specific way. Let's proceed step by step, making reasonable estimates to calculate the final probability. Assume that for any given question, the probability of someone misremembering the correct answer in the exact same wrong way as others is very low, but we need a number to work with. Here's their assumption. Let's estimate that the probability of giving a specific wrong answer for one fill in the blank question is one in a hundred. So that's our assumption and that's being generous. It could, it's really one, in, it's infinite. But if we pare it down to one in a hundred, let's go with that. So if I say who laid down with the lamb, you have 100 options of what it could be in this math. So then it calculates the probability for one person to get all 10 questions wrong a certain way. Then the final probability is 10 people getting 10 questions wrong the same way. And what you come up with is this number here. One in 10 to the 200th power. Now to give you an understanding of how big that is, okay, a trillion is 10 to the 12th power. A quadrillion is 10 to the 15th power. And one quintillion is 10 to the 18th power. And so according to this math, if I have 10 people that I give 10 simple Bible quiz questions wrong to, and they all get all 10 wrong, and they all get them the same way, this is the probability right here. Here's the probability of that happening. The probability of 10 people each misremembering 10 simple Bible quiz questions wrong the same way is approximately one in two Google. <laughs> I saw this today. I was like, this is the greatest day I've had in a long time. <laughs> a Google is a number which is one with a hundred zeros. And my scenario is two Google. And just so you remember, you know, a trillion is 10 to the 12th power. This is 10 to the 200th power. So it's basically, it's basically irrefutable evidence. Now, let me show you the actual interview. And now I did this yesterday with another couple and I got the same exact result. They got 10 out of 10 wrong. Now they wouldn't go on camera, but this guy did. So I'm here to tell you that I will get 10 out of 10 and this will become a reality for us. And then I'll make another video based on the 10 interviews and the math. And then I'm going to ask the entire body of Christ, who's a charlatan? Because now that you know, if you have no answer for this math and this evidence, 
that you have 10 people in a row all getting 10 of these Bible questions wrong the same way, and the math says that it's impossible, if you don't have an answer for us and you don't either repent or become silent, then you are the charlatans, not us. That's how powerful this is. I'm not mad at anybody. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I have a zeal for God's house and the people and the testimonies that I'm getting every day on my, on my channel from people who are like, thank you. I thought I was going crazy. How do you explain these statistics? All right, let me, let me play the interview. Here it comes. I went out on the street today with my camera and my microphones and my, my universal uh, Bible quiz, which you can get on my website at, on the resources tab. And I asked the guy these questions. All right, here we go. Here we are. I'm John, and you are? Sean. Sean, good to meet you, bud. Thanks for you. your time. So we did one question already, which was, judge not blank, you be judged. Could you fill in the blank like you did before? Yeah, I said list. List. Okay, the next one is Job chapter 1. This is where white Job's wife's haranguing him for not cursing God, right? Okay. And he says, the Lord blanks, and the Lord blanks away. It's another King James one. The Lord blanks, and the oh, Lord oh. blanks away. Okay, the, the Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Give me the King james -y version. Okay. Hmm. Take your time. Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Say it one more time. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. Okay. Moving right along. All right, now this one is a, a memory question. Remember when Noah was on the ark towards the end? And he sent the dove out to see if there was land. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the dove came back with something in its mouth. Do you remember? It was something in its mouth to indicate that they had, it had seen land. Yeah, uh, I'm guessing an olive branch, but that's... Olive branch. Is that what you said? That's, that's what I... Yes, yeah, I'm going right, with. Right, so this is just memory, and go with your gut. Go whatever comes first. It's a memory quiz. Go with your first impression. Don't overthink it, right? Yeah, yeah. No theological discussion. I'll give you the score at the end. All right, so this okay. next one is Exodus 12. Remember when God judged Israel, or Asia, I mean, and he went in and, and killed the firstborn. Who went in to kill the firstborn? Peanut Gallery, by the no, way, no. Can, can chime in if you want. Oh, no, no. I'm I, off camera. Well, I don't want you to help me because I want to. Okay. I, I, I think it, I mean, it's, let's see, it's Angel of Death. Say it again. Angel of Death. Okay. No, not it. Okay. That's your, well, no, that's your answer. Yeah, that's my that's it, my answer. Yeah, there, yeah, yeah. There that's, is no right or wrong answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, understand. I understand. That I understand. was understand. perfect. And I know that I'm going to have scored a zero because... So far, so good. That's You're doing what fine. we're setting up, but that's okay. I'm, You're I'm doing great. Along. You're doing great. All right, so now this is the millennial reign. It's in Isaiah. It's a very enigmatic passage. Most people remember this. It's talking about how there'll be peace in the millennial reign, and the blank shall lay down with the lamb. Oh, I, assuming that would be the lion. Okay, moving right along. All right, now this one, Luke 6, 46. I'm going to read this one, and it should be familiar enough to you. And why call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Everyone that comes to me and hears my words and does them, I'll show you what he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug a great foundation upon the, what was the thing he built? A great foundation. The rock. Okay. Rock. And then a flood arose, and something beat against the house. What was that? What was beating against the house for the guy? The waters. I'm assuming the waters. I waters? Don't okay. Know nope. that. You're fine. Let me stop there. Do you guys remember waters or wind? What do you remember, Mark? My initial thought, as you said, it was wind. That's what I remember. What about you guys in the chat? What? What beat against the house? Was it water? Because that's what it says now. But I remember that it, he built the house on the rock, and then the winds came, and but he had a foundation. But then the the person that built it, um, otherwise built it on the sand, and the wind came, right? So now he's going to say sand, which. Or, uh, which is what I'm looking for, but it doesn't say sand anymore. So this is another one, f another win in the Bible quiz scenario. All right. 
And then, but he, he that heareth and doeth not, like, is a man that built a foundation upon the sand. Okay, and what beat against the house for that guy? Same thing? Yeah, yeah, water, yeah. Okay. All right, next question. Genesis 32, Jacob spends the whole night wrestling with somebody. He gets hit in the hip, remember that? Yeah. Okay, who did he wrestle with? Oh, he's a... Uh, and uh, my first... He's doing good, isn't he? My first <laughs> instinct is an angel. Um, Go with that. I don't know if it's uh, spe more specific than that, but I think it's an angel or angel of God. All right, I'll take that. Or maybe right. it's God. Huh? Matthew eighteen twenty. This is a familiar passage. For where two or blank are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst. For where two or blank are gathered together. Uh, believers. Oh, two or more. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two, two or more. Yeah. I guess I didn't listen very carefully. To you're the, good. No, this is very, you're doing phenomenally well. This is perfect. All right, next question. We're getting down to the wire here. And he saith unto me, this is 2 Corinthians 12, my grace is sufficient for thee, and my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here's the question. Wherefore, I take pleasure in weaknesses, in injuries, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am blank then blank for when i am blank then blank can you remember that one <laughs> glorified is that right for i'm glorified He's i take pleasure weakness and necessities for when i am blank then i don't want to give you the give it away is the answer on there can i read it no. Oh, okay. He wants to cheat. No, I don't want to. No, I don't want to read the, uh, the the scripture. No, I'm just saying, like, I, you know, it, it, I'm not following it in my you head. You can say pass. Problem. You can say pass. I know this one's not as on the radar for most people, right. a lot of people. So if you want to say pass, right. that's I'm, fine. I'm just saying, like, if I could see the the, the text without right. the without the answer. Oh, I see what you mean. Maybe, maybe I maybe I could. Close notes. Yeah, the close notes <laughs> portion of it, yeah. Try that. All right. Whether, all right, right here, where it says, where, where I take where pleasure where I in weaknesses and injuries and necessities, for it's when I am blank, then blank, blank, blank. When I am, when I am. Let's talk about being weak or strong and all that. Less, he is more. Nothing comes to mind. That's all right. Let's go yeah. on from that one. All right. All right this, less, one, yeah. this one's very familiar. Hosea 4, 6. My people blank from lack of knowledge. The only thing that comes to mind is suffer, but I'm not sure that that's... The, let me give you the whole thing. Therefore shalt thou fall in the day, and the prophet also shall fall with thee in the night. I will destroy thy mother. My people are, or my people blank from lack of knowledge. What it's a bad thing that yeah, happens yeah. to them. Um, Take your time. Sometimes it'll come to you in a minute. It's a very familiar passage. My people blank from lack of knowledge. I, I, I would just go suffer. I don't know that one. Yeah, I okay. Don't know. I, I, that's yeah. okay. No, I don't know that one. All right, I'll, let me give you a multiple choice on this one. Okay. Destroyed or perish? Hey, I would be perished then. Perish, okay. All right, I'll only get a half a point on that. So at this point, though, I got what I went for. That was five, six, seven. That was eight. He got eight wrong. That's plenty. I mean, that's already plenty of data. He, we go on from there, but um, he ended up getting nine out of, out of 10 questions, one he couldn't answer. And so that is absolutely bombshell because I did the exact same thing the day before, and I already knew this, but just doing it made me really excited because based on the math, that's not possible. See, what we're, what we're being asked to believe is that people are just befuddled. They're just misremembering and, you know, they're confused by misquotes from pop culture. No, no, I will now prove that that's not possible. And that's going to force the intelligentsia to repent. Now, they might attack worse. You know, you might read about me in the papers or something, but regardless... 
we're going to craft a response like this. How do you explain these statistics? Well, they could have you could have paid those people to say that I don't have to believe your evidence. Well, so how about we do this just considering that the data can be verified after by everyone watching? I mean, this is something you is duplicatable. That's one of the characteristics of the scientific process, right? Is it's duplicatable, it's repeatable, it's observable, it's measurable. Anybody can go do this. So if you can't accept the data right now, you should be able to at least assume that if it is accurate, that you could then logically support my position. Would you be willing to do that? Yes. Okay. Well, if you then agree that this is impossible, do you have an alternate theory? No. Okay. Well, since you don't have an alternate theory, that means that your objection to our testimony has been removed. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. So based on that, I'm going to go to page 49 on my in my book. Oh, no, not 49. Sorry, 479. Okay, and I'm going to read some of the questions in here. They just admitted they don't have an answer. So would you agree that since you have no evidence to prove the cause of this event, that you're forced to admit that the cause of the event is unknown to you? Yes. Would you agree that being able to rationally explain the cause of this event represents the foundation for formulating a strong argument? Yes, I guess I would. Would you agree that without understanding how or why your hypothesis was formulated that your argument lacks credibility? This is death by a thousand cuts. <laughs> would you agree that if you cannot provide a rational explanation for the cause of this event that it reveals that your assumption is unsupported? Yes, I guess I would. Would you agree that the force of your argument is diminished because the Mandelite has a verifiable explanation for the cause of our experience and you do not? Yes, I would assume so. All right, so let me jump. Hopefully I won't blow up my computer if I do this. Let me go to Since you agree you have no objections to our testimony, would you agree that the Bible's changing? No, I don't care what you tell me. The Bible can't change. So what is your reason for not accepting our testimony? Well, you're misremembering. Okay, well, let's do the misremembering questions. These are in, your, in the book. And Mark, let's role play. Okay, let's pretend you are a recalcitrant normie that doesn't want to believe that their doctrine could have been wrong their whole life. Okay? And we get to this point, though, you've you've been forced, like, I have just, I don't know, manhandled you into accepting the data, right, that I just showed you. I show you 10 interviews like that, and all 10 get all 10 wrong all the same way. Then I show you the math, and you're recalcitrant, you're evasive, but I bring you back to reality, and you reluctantly agree you don't have an explanation but you're going to go to misremembering and delusion. So I say, well, if you went to your aging parent for the first time in your life and they didn't recognize you, what conclusion would you draw? Your answer would be? Alzheimer's, dementia. Okay. Something and of so that effect. This, and this is a really important question. If you're dealing with someone that doesn't want to know the truth or they have an agenda, you ask them that question. Because one of the underpinnings of their belief system is that all this can be explained because the human memory is unreliable. So by this one question, you can show them that they don't really believe that. You don't really believe its memory is unreliable. Let me prove it to you. And you ask them that question. So now you say this, well, why didn't you choose misremembering as a possibility that your parent didn't recognize you? Now, they're going to search for the words, you know, but essentially, this is the next question explains it. Well, Mark, would you agree that you chose mental illness over misremembering because you believe that the human memory is so reliable? When it comes to vivid memories like memorizing your child or recognizing your child's face, that the only explanation for a parent not recognizing the face of their own child would be mental illness? Would you agree with that? Yes. 
All right. And, and I know you, you're going to try to get off of this. You go wherever you want to go. OK. All right. So would you agree that that you just admitted to some degree that that you believe that the human memory is extremely reliable when it comes to vivid memories? Would you agree that you just said that? Well, it depends on how vivid I see my I saw my aging parent every day of my life and interacted with them till the age of 20. I haven't read the Bible every day in my life, you know, so it, you're comparing apples to oranges. All right, that's a, that's a astute observation, but you didn't answer my question. My question was, would you agree that you just admitted that you believe the human memory is extremely reliable when it comes to vivid memories? Like your I, I would say extremely in the maybe in the top one tenth of one percent of all vivid memories like like an aging parent see now this is interesting what he's doing here is being obstinate and evasive and and everybody that's watching is going to know so we win <laughs> either way you see my point it doesn't matter if somebody does this which is what they'll do they're going to be like that and it won't matter because we will point that out we have different observations around that. Okay, so I'm going to just go on. So, so it, Mark, if I told you that I have a memory of two different events from my childhood, would you be able to tell me which one was more vivid? It would, it would be the one that you associated with your parent. No, I'm saying I have two unrelated memories. I haven't disclosed what the memories are. No, I wouldn't be able to tell. There would be no way. And the Bible bears that out. First Corinthians two says, who can know the spirit of a man except the man. So if I have two memories, you have no way of knowing how vivid it is, or which one is more vivid. Is that correct? Yes, I would say that's correct. All right. And I actually have a study and it's called uh, formation of vivid memories. And it's a peer reviewed study that found that the emotional state that you're in when the memory is formed is the largest contributor to how vivid a memory is. So there's no way for anyone to, to, to guess or suggest if a memory is going to be is going to be vivid or not to that person, because how could they know the emotional state of the person? Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. So based on those observations, here's my final question. Since you concluded that the aging, aging parents memory failure could only be explained by mental illness. And you agree that there is no way for you to know how vivid a Mandelite's memories are. And the Mandelites claim that some memories are as vivid as our children's faces. Would you then agree that unless you can prove that millions of Mandelites have mental illness, the cause for millions of Mandela effect testimonies could not rationally be categorized as misremembering in the same way that you could not categorize the aging parent not wrecking around their own child as misremembering. The thing is, I don't have to prove it. Just because I don't know for sure doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. So I don't know whether your memory is vivid or not, because I'm not inside your body. But I do know that you're misremembering. Because it's obvious because the Bible can't change. That's a that's a gr in interesting observation. But again, you didn't answer my question. So let me restate it. This, the question is very clear. You concluded that the aging parents memory failure could only be explained by mental illness. That was your testimony, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you agreed that there's no way for you to know how vivid someone's memory is. So if I claim that the monopoly guy memory to me is as vivid as my children's face, you can't say that that's not true. There's no way for you to know. Would you agree? With I that? don't know how viv I don't know how vivid the memory is, but right. that doesn't mean that it's not misremembering. Those okay, are two but, different things. Right. But the argument is, or, or my, my question is, if you don't know, then you don't know, you admitted you don't know. Okay, so then the question says this, would you then agree that unless you can prove that we have mental illness, then you can't claim that we're misremembering? If you mm -hmm. can't prove, 
if That's you can't question. prove that our memory isn't as vivid as the parents seeing the face, then you have no grounds to say that we're misremembering. Would you agree? You can't yes, prove it. That's a good question. Okay. That's a good question. There you go. So we just, yes, recalcitrant, but that's what we're up against. All right. So now what I just did, and I've done this with four or five people, and it has worked. With four or five questions, you can get someone. And, and a lot of times pe he was trying to wiggle off the hook. A lot of times people will acquiesce. Four or five questions, you can get them to agree that we're not misremembering, which is bombshell. Okay, but here's another very common argument. You're delusional. All right, so let's try this one. Mark, would you agree that if the unconvinced are correct, that's you, and nothing, and nothing has changed in the environment, because that's what you're telling us, then whatever's causing the Mandela effect testimonies is, is the Mandelites to believe the reality is changing would all be taking place in our minds. Would you agree with that? Yes. All right. So would you agree that if we, as an example, believe that a monopoly guy had a monocle when he never did, then the only way the delusion could possibly be operating would be if we we're having false memories being implanted in our minds somehow. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yes. So let me let me just elaborate a little bit. When I've been told I was delusional, I had to step back and say, well, how am I delusional? How would the delusion actually manifest itself? Okay, so then I thought, well, we have these memories. And we'll use the monopoly guy as an example. I remember the monopoly guy very vividly, having a monocle. I mean, it's burned into my brain. Okay, so if the unconvinced is correct, he never had a monocle, but that memory is there. So somehow, if they're right, a fake memory has been put into my mind, which is what the data sphere is telling us. They call it false memories. Mm. But my memory is actually correct. Something outside of me has changed. It's not my memories are actually working very or perfectly. But let me just I want to clarify that. So let me go on. All right. So Mark, agrees that whatever's taking place is happening inside our minds. So now I'm going to say this. Would you agree that if we, as an example, believe that a monopoly guy had a monocle when he never did, then the only way the delusion could operate would be if false memories are being implanted? I already said that. So you said yes. All right, Mark, would you agree that since peer reviewed studies have proven that both the Mandelite and the unconvinced share the same memories and the unconvinced claim that the Mandelite is delusional based on implanted false memories, then by default, the unconvinced would then also have to be delusional. Let me elaborate. You're saying that we're delusional and we're having false memories implanted in our minds somehow, but you and I do share the same memories. I can give you a bunch of examples, but what I'm saying is in addition to that, I have a peer reviewed study that had a hundred respondents done by, and it's, and it's published in a, prestigious psychology magazines. And what they found was that the unconvinced and the Mandelites both shared the same memories. That's unequivocal and, and proven in a study. So my question then based on that is, if the unconvinced claim that we're delusional based on implanted false memories, and you have the same memories, wouldn't that mean that you're also delusional? If that's true, yes. Well, it is true. I just told you it's true. It's true, and the study's in the book, and you can look it up for yourself. And I could ask you a bunch of questions about what you remember, and you would be forced to admit that you remember the same things we do. So would you agree that if both groups share the same memories, then both groups would need to be considered delusional, and as a result, the hypothesis of the unconvinced would be nullified because you can't be delusional and then suggest that you are more rational than another group with the same delusion that you have. Would you agree with that? Well, that's a phenomenal question. Do you know that? I can't wait until you <laughs> ask someone that question that brings up that ob objection. I can't wait. I, I can't even think of anything to say. <laughs> I don't so, think you that. can. I don't think no. you can get off the hook. 
So would you agree that if you don't have an alternate hypothesis that my reasoning regarding the delusion argument is sound and has eliminated the possibility that the Mandelite testimony can be explained away by delusion? Hmm. I mean, see, I this is what, what we yet. talked about. Yes. This is called what does winning look like? Hmm. Okay. And I'm going to liken it to a sales encounter. I don't get paid as a salesperson unless I close the deal. So what does winning look like? Winning is going to look like people breaking under the pressure of searing logic. It's going to break their cognitive dissonance. It's going to break their agendas. It's going to break their long held doctrines and their sacred cows. And they're eat and I'm going to bring them down into this very tiny space where I've painted them into the corner that they can't escape from like you're like you're in now. And the only two things that I can imagine is that they're going to just fly off the handle and say things like I don't care about all your trick questions. The Bible can't change and hang up or the Holy Spirit is going to come on them and they're going to be astonished for a moment and they're going to be like, they're going to repent. You know what the core is? I'll just go back to the, the to the mathematics, you know, because I would say it's it's far greater than one in two Google. Because it's not just a hundred possible responses. No, it isn't. It, That's being kind, you know, right? Even if it's not infinite, it's got to be thousands. I mean, think about the question for the lion and the lamb. You you could literally answer any animal. You could answer anything. Yeah. I, I, you know, there there's certainly a non-zero probability that someone would say nothing that has to do with the, an, an animal. Really, if, if people are misremembering. So everybody has faith in something. Okay. You know, we're to have faith as Christians, but we're to have faith in the right thing. Jeremiah 17, 5, I think. Cursed is the man who trusteth in man and maketh flesh to be his arm and whose heart departed from the living God, right? So to have faith in the printed words of a page, that's right to the heart of the matter, as opposed to having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. So I think that this is what we're trying to do here. Praise it's the Lord. Go ahead. Keep going. It's it's the Big Bang Theory all over again. It's a form of the Big Bang Theory. It couldn't possibly happen, yet you have faith in it. And to break that delusion is a, is a, is it's a it's a marvelous thing. Yeah, that's all. That's and you know we're not dis we're not disillusioned. We know that most of the people that have the temerity to call in are not going to be converted. We're working for everyone that's listening. We know that we're going to have to go around the people who are in leadership for the most part. Many of them may have got the memo. They may have been called into the room and told not to talk about it. And so it, there's no there's no amount of logic or reasoning or anointed preaching that's going to bring them over um, unless they repent. And I believe those people are going to come too. There's going to be whistleblowers that are going to step forth. In fact, let me mention that if you are in the power structure, if you are a board member of a church or a denomination, or you work in the Christian media, or you work in the publishing houses of Bibles, and you know that the Bible's changing, and your superiors have actually approached you and said to you that the Bible is changing and you're not to talk about it. That's a black mark on your soul, dear soul. If you do not come out and do the right thing, then I fear for you because anybody that knows this is happening and is keeping it covered up is a co-conspirator. And you ha you're going to have to be willing to just do what Jesus said when he came to the disciples. It was noised abroad that Christ was in the area and he comes to Peter and he says 10 words, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. 10 words. And the next verse says, and he immediately dropped his nets and followed him. I'll never forget when I saw that. It was day one when I got saved. That scripture is what God used to call me into the ministry. Because I remember saying, you mean you can just drop everything and follow Jesus? Well, 
The answer is yes, and he's doing it again. All that you've worked for to become the president of the Christian college or the, the dean of the Bible college or you're the executive in the C-suite of the Bible publishing houses and you know this is happening and somehow this video has come across your attention. But you have to deal with God on this. You're going to have to stand before God and give an account for why you chose financial security and your reputation over the truth and all the people that you're responsible for leading astray, dear soul. It's not worth it. Ill-gotten gains profit nothing in the day of wrath. Nothing. <laughs> you better get on the right side. All right, so what this does... Now, I know, I know Paul pretty well now, and he's not a sycophant. If he felt like, because I've begged him to be accountable to him, theologically, and I said, I give you permission to speak into my life. I don't want you to mince words. Uh, you know, I have a thick skin. I need you to be honest with me. I have blind spots. I'm just a human being. So please, okay, take that role in my life. He agreed. So if my doctrines, if my interpretations were out to lunch, he would tell me. Okay, so what I'm telling you is this man who, you know, tried to disparage him, go ahead if you like, but the guy is, I mean, I've never met anybody. I've never personally known someone at the level that I know him that has as much credentials as he does. He's got four theological degrees, and one of them is a PhD in theology. <laughs> That's not small. That's like three degrees first, and then the PhD on top of that. Then he's written 12 books, some of which are used in Bible colleges as curriculum. So go ahead and cast your aspersions, but good luck. This guy is a player, okay? In that, in that realm, okay? We're not putting people with credentials on a pedestal, but I'm just saying as far as what the church power structure is going to hold as valuable. That guy has has juice, okay? Now, what what he's saying is that my book is right on. All right? And that really emboldens me to know that what we're doing is the right thing because we're not disseminating false doctrine. We know that the Bible's changing, but we want to know more. And so the book explores how it's happening. It explores in depth why it's happening, the whole chapter on Abraham. Mm -hmm. And then it explores the, the spin-off doctrines like we've been talking about, the things that are all of us are, are having to formulate responses to this. And those are essentially doctrines that are forming spontaneously. So this is, this is like, unprecedented is not even the word. And what I believe is that God can use this book to bring a reformation, just like Luther when he nailed his 95 treaties on the door of Westminster Church, or whatever it was called, uh, this is very similar to that, guys. The level of destiny that we are all thrust into us, or has been thrust upon us, is mind-boggling. To be those people who see this in this hour and have a voice is something that you cannot turn away from. That's why I'm divorced, because the, des the level of destiny that I felt about the Bible changes was so overwhelming that I could not accommodate packing it in. I would, have, I would have failed God, okay? So this is what Paul said. This was an enjoyable read by a master of mandalism. This is your opus one, your seminal work to date. You write a fluent sentence and replenish it with wisdom, insight, and a splash of humor. A rarity for any writer, but quite a challenge for such a serious subject matter as this. 
you rightly ask the question, do you love the Bible or God? A pertinent query given the changes to the KJV of the Bible in these end times in which we undoubtedly live and regrettably must grapple with. You certainly don't advocate abandoning the Bible. That's another doctrine, by the way, the doctrine of abandonment versus the doctrine of adhesion. But simply recognizing it's now subject to supernatural changes and to be aware of such as ones engages with it. It's challenging now, but not the end of the world. That is to come. So he goes on to say, there are some observations I made as I went through this fine body of work that are worthy of mention. So page 114, Daniel 7.25 will affect times and laws, which certainly relates to his historicity and God's law. I don't really understand what he's saying there. Is, he's agreeing with me, but he's not really making a point. Is he, Mark? Oh, I, I understand what he's saying there. What's he saying? Because in, da in Daniel 7.25, um, if you have it in, in your mind, can, can you provide the, the verse exactly? Uh, Daniel 7.25, you mean? Yes. Yeah, give me a second. One moment, please. I've got so many. Because I think this is me. an important point, and I want to make sure I get this. I want to make sure I get this perfect here. Okay, give me one second. All right, so Daniel seven twenty five. <sighs> KJV. Um, there you go. And he shall speak great words. My memory is it used to say great swelling words. Yes. Ag against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. Right. Okay. So what he's, what I believe Paul Grafton Holt is saying there. Is, is he saying it doesn't specifically say seek to change scripture. Right. But a law is a part of the scripture. That's the point he's trying to make okay. right there. And actually, that's been, that's been something that I've considered in my mind too. So I think he's alleviating a concern. It was a very small concern that some of us might have had. All right, the entirety of which is within the Bible. Revelation 22, 7, whoever keeps the sayings of the prophecy will be blessed, may well relate to your notion of whomsoever memorizes them will be the new preservers, as in Amos 8, 11, style famine of scripture engulfs us. Yeah, so I point that out that in Revelation 22, it may be referring to us directly that those who have memorized the scripture will be of great importance, will be, will be advantaged over those that don't know the word because they won't be able to get the word. Not if I can help it, though. All right, but Genesis eleven six, you ask if AI is repeating itself again. This is an interesting notion which is unique to your thought process. This is an astute observation with some merit. The mark of the beast may well be an implanted brain chip which automatically downloads data from the Antichrist's central source, without which no one can engage in commerce and face relentless persecution to boot. After the millennium? <laughs> we're, actually, we're having that conversation now. He, he is open to that, which I was glad. Uh, many would contend this is yet to come. But either way, we are in the end times prior to Armageddon and prior to Satan's final attempt to subvert mankind thwart, and thwart God's redemptive plan. Thus, the Bible's corruption suggests that the Ab Abrahamic acid test is here once again. Will believers sacrifice their son slash Bible in the faithfulness to their God? Indeed, this is an end times acid test. That's the whole chapter on, Ad, on Abraham. Did you see the changes or not? God is separating the wheat from the tares and is asking us to choose that God was showing Abraham his faith in the sacrificial act was as you posit the central message. Rather than Abraham showing God his faith, God knows everything, including his faith and didn't need a test. Hmm. 